Steve, what do you make about Trump talking of, of NATO and how NATO has to get more involved in the Middle East? Well, I think it goes back to the point that Corey made a moment ago that there really isn't a sound strategic doctrine that one could describe as the Trump doctrine. Uh, the isolationist idea, uh, now we're 180 degrees from that. The getting out of NATO idea, 180 degrees from that. Uh, the reality is that Donald Trump really doesn't think very far ahead. I mean, when the rest of the world in foreign policy is playing chess, uh, you may be seeing a president who tends to be playing checkers. He doesn't think enough moves ahead, and that's how he gets into these inconsistencies. Uh, it is a significant problem for President Trump. Um, and certainly, part of this is self-inflicted. I think it's important to putting this story into context to remember that these sorts of crises did not occur during the time that there was an agreement, an agreement, by the way, reached with the Obama administration and the Iranian government, to, uh, to keep uh, the, Iran the lid on the Iranian nuclear program. When Trump decided to walk away from that, uh, he walked away from what the European allies wanted, and he also walked away from what the Iranians wanted. And ever since then, the situation has been more dangerous, more provocative. I mean, I don't know that we've heard the last of this particular story, but certainly the moment today uh, is a moment to say, uh, to take a, a breath of relief that it could have been much worse. Yeah, we're going to show the region as well in this showdown, and there are so many players on the map between Iran and, and Iraq and the Saudis, the Lebanese, the Israelis, uh, Yemen, and Jordan, and Syria, the Turks. I mean, it, it's, it's very complicated, and this is a part of the world, of course, that has stumped presidents going back decades and decades, and Donald Trump is just the latest. I wonder, Corey, about this idea that because he is so impulsive and unpredictable, that might work in his favor when dealing with a regime like Iran. The fact that they don't know what he's going to do either, and that gives him some sort of a tactical advantage. Well, I think it, it helps in some ways and hurts in others. As Stephen pointed out, you know, you've got to have a strategy, and you could argue whether Obama's administration strategy was the one you would have taken or not. It was at least effective in deterring Iran from uh, being a global actor that, that you know, caused trouble in their own region and caused trouble for us. And so in that sense, it was successful. Now, did it put a permanent lid on it? No, it was temporary. And that's the problem we have in that region constantly, is that we can't figure out a way to just end it once and for all. And I don't think we will. Now, Trump's idea is carry a big stick and have a lot of bluster and occasionally, apparently, spank somebody. And that's what he's done here. And uh, maybe it'll deter him for a while. We're yet to find out. I, you know, it doesn't look like that strategy's worked well with North Korea. Uh, we'll see if it works different in Iran. We are 10 months away from the presidential election. And of course, as Corey knows well, coming from Iowa, the caucuses are less than a month away. I wonder whether you think, Steve, this is an opportunity for the Democrats, let's say somebody like former Vice President Joe Biden, to appear to be the so-called adult in the room, a man who knows a lot about foreign policy and knows a lot about that part of the world. Well, I, I do think that the more the conversation is about foreign policy, uh, the more compelling uh, the environment is for a Biden candidacy. I, I think if we're picking a front runner, Biden is ahead of the others, but not by much. And certainly if the more liberal elements of the Democratic Party were to unite beyond a single nominee rather than being divided uh, between Elizabeth Warren and uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, Biden would be in more trouble. But no doubt about it. Uh, when you look at Biden, and he gave a number of foreign policy interviews yesterday, by the way, um, he does seem to have some advantages with respect to a conversation about foreign policy. I think that uh, one of the challenges that, uh, that Donald Trump faces is that he doesn't appreciate the extent to which other foreign leaders need to look strong in their own countries. And so if you try to call the prime minister of a country uh, on the carpet, if you try to uh, leverage an ally or an adversary by trying to bully them, um, that's just not going to work very well because they have their own domestic constituencies to answer to, and they need to look tough at home. And so I think one of the mistakes that, uh, that Donald Trump often makes is imagining that he's still dealing with some sort of casino regulator in New Jersey rather than the sovereign head of a foreign country that needs to be as tough as he is. Mm. Corey, what's your read? Well, I think all of that's right. And I think, you know, it's worth noting the Dems have their final debate coming up next Tuesday before the Iowa caucuses. And uh, I think that foreign policy is going to play a large role in that. And I think beyond Joe Biden, I'd look for Pete Buttigieg to shine during that. He's got military experience. Uh, he's tried to play that up. Of course, Warren and Sanders are both extreme isolationists. And uh, I don't think they're going to contribute much to this conversation other than saying we need to stay out of this region and end wars. Not that different from what candidate Trump said. 
Uh, so it's a real opportunity before those first votes are cast on the first Tuesday in February for uh, Biden and Buttigieg to really display their strength here. Gentlemen, great to have both of you with us. As always, we appreciate you taking the time. Busy news day. Thank you.